um, a little bit. Um, essentially, what, what, I, what I'd like to uh, discuss is the research and development, also known as the research and experimentation tax credit. This is a federal tax credit that rewards companies for the development or improvement of their products and their processes. Um, so here are the, t the things that we're going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about the type of activities that qualify for research. Most of you are, if you're a manufacturer, you're performing research. I, I don't know many manufacturers that aren't doing it because of the broadened definition of what is research and development. We're going to talk about the type of expenditures that qualify for this credit. While there are, are uh, numerous different types of expenditures that qualify for a research deduction, there are only three that qualify for the credit. And so we're going to talk about that. There's two, right now, there's two different methodologies for calculating the credit. There's the traditional credit, and then there's this new alternative simplified credit that was, re that was introduced in the tax Taxpayer Relief Act of 2006 on December 8th of 06. It was enacted in 2007 and thereafter. So we're going to talk about that because a lot of times companies say, well, I don't have my information from the base period because it is an increasing, it's a credit for increasing your research activities. And, that, and you're increasing over a focal point, and you need to have that information from the base period. Well, this alternative simplified credit just, just made it a lot easier to, to, to identify that information. We're going to talk about what, what you need to do in order to substantiate the credits, because it's, it, 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 that's one of the critical points to claiming this credit, is the ability to substantiate any time spent on research and development. And, and I'm allowed to use estimates, so I'm going to get into that a little bit. Um, we're going to talk about some of the determining factors. That, uh, that, that, that allow you to claim supply costs. And we just had some new developments just as, as late as September 5th. Last Thursday, they issued new treasury regulations um, for the research and experimentation deduction. And then we're going to talk about offset of AMT. One of the, one of the most common uh, things that I hear that, that why somebody might not be claiming the credit is, well, we're in the alternative minimum tax, and therefore we can't utilize any of the credit. Or we're an S corporation, and when it flows out to my husband and I, or to my wife and I, um, that we're, we're, we just can't claim the credit uh, because we're in the alternative minimum tax. Well, that while that is is the general rule, there's exceptions to that rule, and I'm going to get into that a little bit as well. So the federal credit it's it's governed by Code Section 41. Uh, it's essentially a wage-based credit. There's three different types of expenditures that are eligible for this credit, um, but for the most part, the majority of it is going to be wages. Uh, we can look at any open tax year. As a general rule, most people, when they talk about going back and amending income tax returns, we're talking about the last three years. However, there is a little known, little known revenue ruling from 1982 that always allows me to adjust my carry forwards. And so I just got done calculating a 14-year credit study for a taxpayer. There was $5 million in sales, and their savings was north of $400,000. Over $400,000 of tax refunds coming into this $5 million manufacturer. It was, it, it, was, it was astronomical, the amount of savings and the amount, and, and the amount of, of uh, jobs that could be created because they, it allowed them to then turn around and expand and grow. Uh, any ref these refunds that you receive from the IRS, they're income tax free. You don't get to deduct your federal income taxes. You don't have to pay uh, income tax on those dollars when, when, when they're received in the form of a refund. About 35 states have a research credit program of some sort. Um, I, I sure would like to see Missouri be the 36th um, that, 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 that has this program. And, and most of them, it's a credit for increasing research activities. But for the most part, there's some percentage of the expenditures that you're going to get a benefit from. That ranges from 1% in North Carolina uh, up to, uh, it, it's 40% in Louisiana if you have less than 50 employees. That type of, of, of ability to subsidize research efforts really kind of help help companies determine where they might, might locate new research facilities or new manufacturing facilities. And frankly, I'd really like to see, see Missouri um, get, get, get on board with that again. Um, six out of our eight surrounding states have a research credit program. So what is research? Research is, is, there's four major requirements to a qualified research activity. The first is that I have to be developing or improving a business component that's held for sale, lease, or license, or used in my business. And business components are products processes, techniques, formulas, inventions, or software applications. For the most part, for a manufacturer, we're talking about products and processes, the development of new products, the improvement to my existing products. Maybe I'm improving the functionality or reliability or quality or performance of that product uh, or, that, or, the, or, or, for that matter, that process. Custom manufacturers can qualify for this credit. They, they not, may not be developing, but doing the product development, but they're certainly doing the process development. 
So, uh, for instance, I do a lot of work in the plastics industry. If I'm an injection molder and Ray comes to me and says, hey, I've got this, this plastic part I'd like you to, to manufacture for me. Well, he's already designed the plastic part, but now I've got to develop a manufacturing process. I'm probably going to be involved in the tooling develop, design and development. How many cavities is that mold going to have? Where's the, where's the, where's the, uh, the runner going to go in? How, how wide is the runner? Um, how am I going to eject the part out of my injection molding machine? These sort of things that, that manufacturers think about on an everyday basis are qualified research because I'm developing or improving that product or process. It has to be technological in nature, meaning it fundamentally rely upon the sciences, whether those sciences be biological, chemical, any of the computer sciences, uh, or any of the engineering disciplines, whether that be mechanical, structural, electrical, industrial uh, engineering disciplines that I'm relying upon. Maybe I'm relying upon those principles to implement lean. And maybe I have to improve upon my manufacturing process in a technological manner to implement one of these lean principles. It's qualified research. There has to be uncertainty at the outset of the activity in either the capability, the method, or the design of developing or improving that business component. Capability is, is, is uh, it's kind of like what used to be the old rules for claiming this credit. The old rules said that I had to expand, exceed, or refine the knowledge in their industry. Well, that's a pretty high hurdle to overcome, to do something that nobody else is doing, and not only that, prove it to the IRS that nobody else is doing it. But they added method and design uncertainty, the how. How can I make a more reliable product, a more reliable process? How can I improve the performance of this, of this product? Can I add functionality? Those sort of things are all going to be uncertain at the outset because uncertainty is defined as more than one alternative. And if I'm evaluating those, those alternatives in a process of experimentation, it's qualified research. And that's the fourth requirement, process of experimentation. A process of experimentation is defined as modeling, simulation, or systematic trial and error. Well, modeling is AutoCAD, SolidWorks, any other things you might be using modeling software in order to, 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 to design a product. Or maybe you're making prototypes and then testing those prototypes. Heck, the first article part counts as a research expenditure. Simulation. I, I mentioned injection molding. A lot of them in, simulate the resin being shot into that mold to see if I'm, am I going to have air pockets? Am I going to have cracking? Am I going to be able to fill all the cavities? Those sort of things. Those simulation activities are qualified research. And then finally, everybody's favorite, systematic trial and error. I identify different alternatives, evaluating them, and discard the ones that aren't the best. And, that, and, that's, and that's research. Because I'm, as long as I'm doing it in a systematic approach, now that doesn't mean that I have to, like Monsanto or like Boeing, write R&D reports this thick in order to, to describe to my management team what I investigated and how I spent the research dollars. But you've got documentation that supports it already. You've got you've got iterative drawings. You've got notes on those drawings. You've got uh, you've got testing reports. Those sort of things are all going to be qual documentation that helps substantiate these, re these these credits. So here are some examples of some qualified research activities: developing new product designs or improving existing designs. Maybe I'm improving the functionality uh, of a particular design, or maybe I'm improving the functionality for a specific customer. That counts. Um, experimenting with, with, with uh, performance variables to improve manufacturing processes. I'll go back to the injection molder. What temperature am I going to heat the mold to? A, a, a few degrees could make all the difference, especially with, in cycle time. Or can I reduce cycle time on this process? And experimentation in order to figure that out. Designing tooling, jigs, fixtures, dies, those sort of things are all going to be qualified research because they're all related to the development or improvement of my product or my process. Using automation, robotics, those th the, it, implementing those, those as, as much as your vendor might tell you so, they aren't plug and play. There's an experimentation element that goes into that. And how is it going to work within my process? I've got an upstream process and I've got a downstream process. In order to get the most out of this new piece of equipment, I'm going to have to experiment with it. I'm going to have to run trials. I, I, I don't know what's going to be my, my, my best throughput in that regard. Um, you know, if you're experimenting with different alloys or materials or resins or those, or those sort of things are all going to be qualified research. Um, and, and, you know, I probably should, should, should point out something. In identifying uh, these qualified research, our, our team has realized that tax geeks like me aren't the best people to identify qualified research activities. So we went out and hired engineers. 
I've got a chemical engineer who's a PE and a certified energy manager on staff that sits down with your engineer to figure out, well, what are the qualified research activities and what documentation exists to support them? I've also got a, a, a metallurgical engineer who is a foundryman for 25 years on staff that, that frankly just knows manufacturing. And that's actually what made me think of the, 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 sla the second last bullet point, experimenting with new materials or alloys, uh, is what made me think of it. Because one of our engineers has experience with one of the alloys that one of my clients is using in order to develop a new process of lining sewer tanks, or lining sewer uh, pipelines. And they are experimenting with this new alloy, and he was able to actually give some insight uh, as to uh, the alloy itself and whether or not it could... Uh, could, could withstand uh, the, the, the weathering conditions that were, were going to be uh, put on this. Quality counts. See that last bullet point there? Research and development or research and experimentation spans an organization. If you think about it, as you're going through the process and develop a new product, you're going to have to test it. Am I meeting spec? Am, am, am I going to meet my customer specifications? Am I going to meet internal specifications? Am I going to meet regulatory specifications? That testing of those products and those processes by typically done by my quality department in a first article or even a PPAP type environment are qualified research. They're directly supporting the research efforts of the engineer or the person doing the design work. So there's three types of expenditures that qualify for this credit. The first is probably the largest. The first is wages. So that's wages spent by my employees performing qualified research. They could be an engineer that is doing a design, that developing a new design or improving an existing design. It could be um, a scientist that's performing an experiment. Um, it, could, it could be uh, a process engineer that's actually out there with, working on, on a piece of machinery or equipment trying to improve that manufacturing process. I get to count directly supporting qualified research activities. Um, so maybe I've got a production line employee or a quality employee that's directly supporting the qualified research activities of that engineer or that scientist. Uh, direct supervision counts as well. Maybe I've got a, uh, an engineering manager that is reviewing or, or participating in design review meetings, qualified research. The company is paying that employee to directly supervise or directly support those qualified research activities. That's qualified research time. Supplies used in the conduct of research. That's anything tangible used in the research process that isn't subject to an allowance for depreciation. So supply costs might be prototypes. It could be prototype jigs, tooling, fixturing. It could be the product itself. Let me say that again. It could be the product itself. I could sell that prototype to my customer and it counts. I just got paid. The Navy just paid me for a ship I just built. I made one. Well, that was experimental. I, w I went through a process of experimentation in order to see if I was going to meet specifications. And I'm talking about a real court case, Trinity Industries. Trinity Industries made ships for the Navy. And they, and they, they, they built what they called first in class. And they actually sold the prototypes. They got to include the material costs of the ships themselves. And the IRS argued, well, wait a minute. The taxpayer included paint. Surely paint is not experimental. And the judge said, the ship sinks. Can they recover the cost of that paint? Well, well, no, they can't. It's a sunk cost into that prototype. And so there is something called the shrinking back rule. And you shrink down to the smallest subset of activities that might qualify for this credit. But the paint that was on the ship that was being experimented with was part of that. And so you shrink down, you know, you, 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 the, the inquiry always turns to who bears the risk of failure? So if this doesn't work, who, who's at risk? Am I going to be able to recover that? Is my customer going to pay me for that, help subsidize that? Well, if it's with the DOD, no, it, it's not. So that's something to be cognizant of. We just had new Treasury regulations issued on September 5th that are proposed. They're not finalized yet. But it, it makes that clear, that I can end up selling my prototype and I get to include those costs. That's huge. And then contract research, where you pay an outside party to perform research on your behalf. That could be an independent engineering firm. It could be an independent contractor. Maybe he's not a W-2 employee 
and and he's assisting me um, you know in, in my research efforts I get to count 65 percent of those costs now when it's all said and done the, the credit is about six or seven percent of whatever those those research dollars are so let me give you an example let's say I'm a 25 million dollar manufacturer my wages are running maybe five to six million dollars total wages let's say 20 percent of that counts and let's just make the math easy so five million so million dollars of qualified research expenditures each year that's sixty five thousand dollars in tax credits dollar for dollar credits against tax now let's say you haven't claimed the credit for the last three years now I'm gonna do my current year plus the prior three that's over two hundred fifty thousand dollars in savings for something that I'm doing in order to be competitive in my environment so I mentioned there's two different credit methodologies the first the law was written in 1989, so that's why the rules say 84 to 88. Haven't been updated since. And this is the traditional credit. It's equal to 20% of the excess over a base amount. Well, the base amount is the product of a fixed base percentage and my average gross receipts for the prior four years. The fixed base percentage is you look back to a base period. and that base period, you calculate your qualified research expenditures. You divide them by your gross receipts. And that percentage is the percentage of today's sales that I have to exceed before I receive my first dollar of credit. And so let's say in 84 through 88, I was spending 1% of my sales on research and development. Now, I've, now let's fast forward to 2013, and now I have to look at the prior four years, and I multiply that 1%. That's what I have to exceed before I receive my first dollar in credit. Pretty onerous, going back to 1984 to 88, almost 30 years, to calculate what you were doing back then under today's definition of research. Because back then, I might have a general ledger, I might have financial statements, I might have a tax return, but I had a different definition of what research was. So I'm not going to have contemporaneous documentation. This goes back to something I made a point about earlier, is I'm allowed to use estimates. If I can prove research is taking place, I'm allowed to use estimates and th that are corroborated by existing documentation. The documentation many times exists. I just worked with a company that had their, their W-2s from the 1930s. I was amazed. Uh, the safe was about, about the size of this room uh, that they had. Um, but, but even if you don't have the documentation from the 80s, well, let's say I went around the 80s, then there's startup company rules. And, and that, that, that probably requires a little bit more time to, to get into. Um, but, but you might go back to 1998 or 2003, or you just might go back to the first five years you had, had both research and sales in those years. Um, but on December 8th of 2006, they passed this Taxpayer Relief Act. They extended the credit for two more years, and they introduced this new alternative simplified credit. So now this alternative simplified credit, the, you still have to exceed a base amount. And the base amount is equal to 50% of the average of my prior three years. So let's think about this for a minute. The credit for increasing research activity now rewards companies for not increasing at all. Let's say I spend a million dollars each and every year. Well, 50% of the average of that's 500,000. So I take my million dollars of current expenditures, less my $500,000 base amount, yields an excess of 500,000. Now this one's a credit rate of 14%. But I just got a $70,000 tax credit and I didn't increase my research activities at all. This credit is there to reward innovation. It's to reward this type of activity. Now, let's say I spent 1.5 million. Well, the credit's gonna go up exponentially. It's just not gonna go up the half it's going to go up 14 cents on 14 cents on the dollar for each and every one of these. So now let's talk about substantiating the credits. Substantiating research credits um, is important. It, you've got to be able to substantiate the research expenditures. So what we generally do is we allocate employees' time by project. Now let's say, you know, can, Mike, I'm a machine shop. I I do 3,000 projects a year. Uh, the law of diminishing returns tells me that I'm not going to have my employee go and say that he worked a half an hour on each one of these or 45 minutes on this one and so forth. And I agree with that. So what we'll do is we'll lump in, into different product categories or projects and lump them together. And so, so hard, pro, you know, very difficult uh, technological projects, uh, middle ground projects, and then easier projects. Heck, the easy projects might not even qualify. So that's step one. And so you, you, the, the key here is to identify the different business components, the different projects, and identify where the time's being spent. 
time, second bullet point, you know, time records are great. But how many, how many in here keep time records like I do to the tenth of an hour? No, 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 no attorneys or CPAs in the room, it looks like. Uh, so these the, nobody keeps time records like this. So in, in identifying these qualified research expenditures, what we start with is a project list, and we ask, our, ask the employees to allocate their time. Keep in mind, I know what the expenditure is. I've got a W-2. I've got a W-2 that says, says John Smith made $100,000 this year. Now what portion of that $100,000 of, of expenditures is a research expenditure versus what portion of that is a uh, is, is an ordinary necessary business expense, one that is, doesn't meet the definition of research. Both are still deductible. And let me be clear about something. We're talking about deductions and credits. I get both. The precursor to the research credit is that it's a research expenditure under, under, under Code Section 174. So, uh, you know, there's, there are costs that, that are research expenditures, such as patent attorney fees, that don't meet the definition of a Section 41 credit, the research tax credit. So that's an, an important to identify. And, you know, I mentioned earlier that I can use estimates if I can prove research is taking place. Well, this 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 third bullet point are just a few, just a couple examples. I've got a three-page sheet of other examples that, that might be be important for companies to to just maintain and keep in their project files because it helps substantiates the credits. But iterative drawings are fantastic. It proves that I didn't know what it was, know what the design was right, right from, the, from the start of the research project. That iterative nature shows that research is taking place. So I mentioned supplies used in the kind of research. Um, we had some new developments on this, so I wanted to just put an extra slide in here. TG Missouri uh, is an injection molder. And they made, they made parts for Toyota. Steering wheels, dashboards, things of that nature located here in Missouri, and what their process was, was they would get a product design in, a part design in from their customer, and then they'd design a mold. TG Missouri would then go and design a mold, and then they'd go to a third party tool maker and say, Mr. Third Party Tool Maker, I need you to make me a, a mold that meets this, that, that these, meets these specifications. Third party tool maker would sell them that mold, so I just spent $50,000 on a mold, I paid $50,000 on, on a mold to a third party tool maker. I bring that in house. I then experiment with it. If you've ever talked to an injection molder, he can tell you the mold never works the first time. And so that experimentation, that tweaking, um, you know, how am I going to eject the part? Those sort of things is experimentation. So I'm using that supply in the conduct of my research. Once I meet spec, once TG Missouri passed the PPAP, it sold the customer the mold. So I sell the, sell the mold to my customer, and then I, now it doesn't actually leave my plant because I keep possession of it, but title transfers. Well, that mold just became a product. And earlier in my presentation, I said that products I sell that were prototypes and there were research expenditures, I get to count. This TG Missouri was kind of the premise to the IRS saying, okay, okay, we get it. These, these, are, these are research expenditures. And, the, and, these, and these can qualify. In fact, that court case was listed in the new proposed treasury regulations. It, those proposed regulations had four major requirements, or four major changes. The first one says, we are clarifying that prototype costs that, are, that end up in finished goods, that are ultimately sold to my customers, can qualify as research as long as it meets the definition of 174. This is huge. I mean, I had a client that was about $17 million company that was claiming $40,000 a year in credit. They're, they're claiming $160,000 $160, off their tax liability each year. There is case law against claiming research expenditures. And the key there is direct versus indirect. So product versus process. Whether or not I'd spend the dollars regardless of whether or not I'm performing research. So in TG Missouri, in the Trinity Industries case, when I, was, when I was developing that new product to be sold, so the Trinity was the shipbuilders, TG Missouri was the mold, both of them were doing research on a product that they were then turning around and selling to their customer. That was allowable. Union Carbide is a subsidiary of Dow, and they were making 
uh, this, this one chemical, there were actually, it was multiple different chemicals, but it was a anti-coking um, uh, chemical that, that, they, that they were producing. And they were trying to improve the manufacturing process. Wasn't the, the process was already developed, the product was always developed. They, they, were, they were trying to improve upon that manufacturing process. And in trying to improve upon that manufacturing process, they were, they were, they were cranking out material, which they turned and sold to their customers. And the court said, wait a minute, you're asking for credit for something that you turned and sold to your customer that you would otherwise be doing anyway, absent the research? That's where, that's where it was. Because it was an indirect research expenditure. It was indirect. I, whether or not I was performing research or not, whether or not I was trying to improve my process, I'd still be using those chemicals in order to produce my, pro my, my production, in order to do production. Fine line. But some of the differentiating factors are their product versus process development, and then new pro new business component versus improved business component. So, you know, if I was, let's say, TG Missouri, the facts are changed already, and I already sold the first mold, and now they want two molds, and I was trying to tweak the manner in which I produce that mold, I I, I would probably advise that taxpayer not to claim that second mold. Uh, not probably. I would. I would advise the taxpayer not to claim that second mold because it falls in that union carbide trap. So there's a couple different limitations to this credit. It's not refundable. So I have to be making money in order to utilize the credit. There's the income limitation. So I've got to have income from the entity. Now I can be a C corporation paying the tax. I can be an S corporation, or I can be an LLC um, or a partnership, and that would flow out to the owners of that flow-through entity. But there are, there are a couple of limitations. The, the income limitation is one of them. So I've got to have income from the entity. The other one is the alternative minimum tax. This is by far the one that, that, that gets most taxpayers that are trying to claim this credit. So for those of you that may not know, we actually have two different systems of tax in the country. You pay the greater of the two. There's the regular income tax and the alternative minimum tax, the AMT. The AMT, you probably hear about the news, up until this January 2nd, when they, when they finally index the darn thing for inflation, every year Congress would have to go in and index it for inflation and, and say, oh, well, all these, these tens of millions of people are going to be now subject to the AMT unless we fix it. And so each year they have had to fix it. Well, that, that, that should go away now. But there's still this, 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 this fact. So if you've got a flow through entity and you're making somewhere between 150000 and 450000 Chances of you being in the AMT are pretty good. If you're in a state that has high income taxes, chances of you being in the AMT is pretty good. Well, you cannot use the research credit to offset AMT, except in a couple of instances. If I'm an eligible small business, meaning I'm less than $50 million in sales, any tax year beginning in 2010, I can offset the AMT. In addition, you get, a, you get to carry that credit five, back, five years back rather than just the traditional one-year carryback opportunity. So if you can't utilize a general business credit, Generally, you get to carry that back one year or forward for 20 years. Well, this is kind of a blue light special on, on general business credits in that I get a five-year carry back and I can offset the AMT for any credits generated in 2010. In addition, this second provision, and I'm going to get a little geeky with you and quote another code section, but 41G. 41G allows me to offset the AMT when I've got credits in excess of income attributable to that entity. So let's say Ray and I are both 50-50 both, both S corporation shareholders, and we just generated a credit of $200,000, so we get 100 each. And in looking at my, my, my credit, let's say my share of the income is 30000 and my share of the tax then is $10,000. let us just say make it a third. Well, my share of the credit is 100000 my, share, my, my tax attributable to that entity is 10000 That 90000 over and above, when that's carried back or forward, I can offset the AMT. Most people don't know this. Most of my competitors aren't even aware of the, of the, of the second bullet point. So it, it's something to be, be cognizant of. So don't self-censor yourself into, into thinking, well, I'm in the AMT, and therefore I, 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 I can't claim the credit. So there are opportunities to do so. So I just threw a whole lot of information at you guys. As I mentioned at the start of my presentation, uh, it was probably boring to some. I, 
I, I get to get up here and talk about taxes, and not many people find it as interesting as I do. Amen, brother. So, uh, <laughs> so what, what questions might anybody have? Just so you know why I said that, I, mean, I do the same thing. I am a tax guy, too. So I have to just got a very specific question that's interesting your union power by the example. So I'm a similar business. If you have to change a process, to change a product specification, to get access to a new market, mm -hmm. does that qualify? It could. And, and I also want to... percent of products the same, it, it could, because what was happening is they weren't trying, in Union Carbide, <coughs> they weren't trying to, to change the product at all. They were trying to change the process. And they, it wasn't a new process or anything like that. So in your example, you're changing the specification of a product, and therefore it can qualify for the credit. In addition, Union Carbide, they got all the wages associated with that. So the wages was actually what would otherwise be the biggest piece in, in Union Carbide over a two year period it was $1,045 worth of wages versus the $88 million of material that they were trying to claim. <coughs> so we, we actually thought it was a victory because we got a lot of the wages that was based on estimates and stuff. It was a 2009 court case and Doug Miller from my office and I actually wrote an article in the Journal of Taxation on it um, uh, which is kind of for tax geeks like me, that's like the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, and, and so uh, we've got a, we, we, we wrote this article on all these different wins. But the lion's share of the credit was actually disallowed. But it was just on the material costs because it was process improvement. But in your instance, when I'm trying to improve product, that counts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You said that contract research was eligible. Is that true even if it's paid overseas? It is not. It, 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 everything, I should have clarified that. Everything today that I'm talking about is U.S. research credit. Now, there's numerous states that have, or numerous other countries that have research credits as well. Uh, so if the research is taking place overseas, there might be a credit there for them uh, in that regard. But it has to happen here in the United States. I can send the check to New York, but if the research is happening in India, it doesn't fit. Which is another reason why you have the credit, which is another reason why we want to have the state level credit so you actually do the research here. And for, like for instance, I'm just going to, one of our neighbors, Iowa, has a research credit. They, you have to perform the research in Iowa in order to qualify for that credit. So each of the states respectively require that the research happen in their state and we actually have to go through an allocation process if an employee is performing research in two states. Yes. Regarding uh, product development, just in having a uh, meeting where you're trying to identify ways to improve products and not really be simple to it, but idea generation is that. Yes, that's, that's hypothesis <coughs> development. So conceptual design and, 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 and identifying of different design alternatives that, that one might then go and take on can qualify. And I just mean on cost, they're not indirect costs, they're all just direct costs. Direct costs. Direct costs. Those, those would be direct costs because it's directly related to the product development. You know, one of, the, one of the requirements in tax law is that you capitalize all these other indirect costs into your cost of goods sold. It's called 263 cap A, or the UNICAP, Uniform Capitalization Rules. 170, if it meets the definition of 174, meets the definition of research, it's exempt from those rules. And therefore, I don't have to include that. And that's exactly what you're talking about. That's where you get a lot of the executives. And being a wage-based credit, their pay tends to be a little bit higher. Yeah, and we, we, we typically want uh, corroborating documentation. You know, proving that a president of an organization performs research uh, is more difficult than proving a scientist or an engineer performs research. You know, if you think about it, the IRS thinks everybody's a Fortune 500 company, and that the, there's no way that the president of the company could be performing research. Well, that's, they're the tinkerers. They're the ones that started the company because it's what they love. And they're the ones that are going to be on the shop floor making sure that that ro robot they just spent $800,000 on is working. And they're the ones experimenting with it and, 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 and viewing those, those, those right, right there. So we do want more documentation related to that. So meeting minutes are great. 
Who, who was in the meeting? So if companies aren't claiming, we, if we can't substantiate it, we just have them tweak their processes a little bit in order to make sure in the future years, I do get that. Payments made to Missouri Enterprise certainly can qualify. Hallelujah. Wow, that's just set up. <laughs> <laughs> yes? If, if something isn't uh, moving forward, is it going to be an idea is not developed, it's still not moving forward? It is. Right. Failures count. In fact, no other area do I, want to hear, do I want to hear about failures other than the research credit. If something doesn't work, that just proves I was uncertain at the outset. So I want to document those type of projects, not because I would like to remind our, our, our clients of, of something that, that has, probably has a bad taste in their mouth, but it, it, frankly, it helps prove that research is taking place. Any other questions? 